Welcome to another episode of Untangling Web3, or maybe I should say Entangling Web3, because today's topic is quantum computing. We've been wanting to talk about this topic for a long time because it's very, very hot in the tech industry. Everyone's talking about it. It's a big buzzword. So today, this is just going to be an introductory episode into the origins and key characteristics of some of the quantum theory that underpins quantum computing and lays the foundation for the next episode in this two-parter about the impact of quantum computing and actually what it means for us in the modern world and Web3 in general. So, Alec, let's get this one started. It's going to be a, it's going to be a difficult one, but let's see what we can do. Yeah, I sort of start off by saying I did not sanction the entangling joke. If I had known about that, I would have cancelled it, but here we are. Um, yeah, this is a big one. Like we've wanted to do it for a while. I think we've kind of been a bit worried because it's a very difficult topic. I know Jack's got the background in, in physics over there. So hopefully he's going to do a bit of the heavy lifting today. But super relevant, very relevant across all the Web3 fields, especially when we start to talk about blockchain, encryption, all these things. But yeah, today we're going to be talking about the basics, the bread and butter of how it came about, the history of quantum, um, some of the key characteristics of quantum, specifically entanglement and superposition and what they mean for computing and what computers look like. So yeah, let's kick this off and go to the early history of quantum physics. Yeah, exactly. So first thing to do is talk about what does that first word in quantum computing mean, quantum. And essentially, until the early 20th century, so the kind of early 1900s, there was one view of how the world worked, which is what we now call classical physics, classical mechanics, that describes all the phenomena we see in the world, in space, kind of the large scale of the world. But then as scientists started to look at smaller and smaller systems, things like atoms, electrons, and then in later years, subatomic particles, then they realized the classical mechanics didn't quite describe things very well. So in those early years of the 1900s, there were a bunch of uh, observations made by scientists, a bunch of predictions and, and theories written that describe things at this smaller scale, what we, we now call the quantum scale. And these new predictions, these new theories would bear out to be accurate in, in practice. And they that's what now we now call uh, quantum physics. But it caused a lot of consternation in the community, right? Not everyone was happy about this new way of thinking, right? Yeah, you, you're totally right. Like in early 1900s, where we were at was we knew that atoms existed and to a degree we knew that electrons existed, but we didn't really know why elements behave differently. We didn't really know too much about electrons, namely because, you know, we couldn't have the, the tools to actually measure them properly, I'd say. So you had this big man named Max Planck. I know he's a bit of a hero of yours, Jack. And he noticed, so had some observations around melting uh, steels and melting iron and melting you know, metals, basically. And as you would add temperature, you would get these, these discolorations, these changes. But unlike most of this classical kind of physics we talk about, where we have this continuum occurring, you would have these discrete steps occurred that he couldn't actually work out as to why. So, you know, I heat my iron. Um, I don't know why I'm heating iron. I'm a forger, blacksmith in the medieval ages or something like this. And it changes color. It changes to yellow. And I keep heating it. And it's still yellow. And then there's a discrete jump as I get to a certain threshold of temperature that it goes to orange. And it stays at that threshold for a while. Then eventually it goes to blue. And we basically had these discrete steps these discrete quantities and you know that's kind of where it came about like that's why max planck came up with the term quantum because of these discrete quantities of basically energy being taken by these atoms yeah exactly so the the word quanta where quantum is derived from it just describes a a specific discrete amount of something and it as you said it it contrast with the the continuous world we'd expect if you heated up the iron it would go through all the colors in the in the rainbow essentially all that spectrum of colors you could go from light yellow to kind of darker yellow orange and everything up to kind of very very strong blues um but that's not we saw it in reality and there was actually another observation um so einstein in around 1905 Mm -hmm. he uh, he came out with the his description of the photoelectric effect, which was a similar thing. So iron there, you have absorbing heat in, in these certain quantities. He also found that the photoelectric effect meant that electrons could also absorb um, light energy in different quantities as well. So this is something that Einstein actually won the Nobel Prize for, I think. Um, but yeah, this was a very strange world, right? This was a very new mm. way of looking at things. It didn't It didn't fit with... Uh, the old classical view, and then this this bore a huge uh, new field of, of of research called quantum physics, right? And then 
You've got not four everyone on the mind, that. I think, there. A little link there. <laughs> yeah, Neil's four. I didn't mean to slip that in, but we'll come yeah, to Neil's four did. now. <laughs> but it's just crazy, the, the amount of names. Like, we've only been talking for less than a couple of minutes, and the, the amount of names we're bringing into this. They're, they're like the big names of physics and science. They're kind of the names that are household names in, in many places. But yeah, Max Planck kind of challenged classical physics, introduced the concept of like Planck constant. Anyone who's done any physics at any stage knows about this. And he laid the groundwork for quantum mechanics and basically started the boom of science around and subatomic particles and kind of after that you know jack just name dropped him a bit early there two camps kind of emerged for the study around subatomic particles that are kind of relevant to this one was niels bohr and the other was schrodinger the famous schrodinger and yeah there were kind of two camps that were opposed in some ways initially they kind of was a bit of slandering toss between them because they viewed the subatomic world in a different way but in the end it kind of the two ways basically describe the same system but just from a different viewpoint yeah, exactly. So, and, and and lots of their debate was around how you view electrons. So, Niels Bohr, who you know, if you've seen things like Oppenheimer, lots of these names will be uh, will be familiar to you. That Niels Bohr is the one that was played by Kenneth Branagh in that film. Um, so his view was that electrons are like particles in fixed orbits around a nucleus of an atom at a high level. And Schrödinger had this alternate view, which was that they are, are more like waves. So if you've ever heard of quantum before in high school, you may have heard of the, the, the wave particle duality. And this is kind of a, a core part of, of uh, quantum physics is that, you know, uh, things like light, like photons can, can behave like waves and particles. So can things like electrons and at a small scale, everything kind of looks the same. So that's the kind of key is that they were both had different descriptions, Niels Bohr and Erwin Schrödinger, for the same phenomena. And they were just coming at it from different perspectives, right? I think, you know, one of the, the ways it's been described is that one of them was doing the maths in Roman numerals, one was doing it in uh, Arabic numerals, but they were getting the same results. They just had different ways of interpreting what was going on. I mean, if I was at the time, I would have agreed with Bohr because that's the only thing that would have made sense to my simple mind is the idea of having these fixed particles. As soon as we start to get to this like wave-like kind of probabilistic location, so we don't know exactly where they are, there's like a probability they're going to be somewhere, maybe a probability they're going to be somewhere else. Like it kind of just blows the mind a little bit. I think a way to simplify this is that the kind of the classical deterministic science is very much like outcomes are two plus two always equals four. And when we start to get to this wave particle duality where you know, Schrodinger's kind of viewpoint that electrons behaved as waves and they were in probabilistic locations, so there's a 20% chance it could be here, a 40% chance it could be here. Imagine if your maths now changes to two plus two has a 10% chance of equaling five. All of a sudden it becomes quite impractical when we think on the big scale, but it's very useful when we start to think on the smaller scale. And you know this kind of viewpoint really led to groundbreaking research in how we actually she understood sub subatomic particles yeah th that's the kind of one of the, th the third key features of quantum physics is the is the probabilistic nature of it so as you said everything normally in classical physics is deterministic my my molecule is here my 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 brick is here right because it's a macro phenomenon right you have these objects kind of physics classes you know you've exactly been in, my are. brick is here <laughs> lots of interesting physics you can do with bricks honestly um, maybe in wales <laughs> Um, but but, but the the, quant the quantum view of this is actually when you go to that smaller scale, then everything becomes probabilistic. My electron doesn't exist necessarily in one place. It could be anywhere. And, and you have a probability distribution that tells you how likely it is to be uh, in each place. And so the, these are some of the key features. And this is something obviously that you know, I mentioned Einstein. He really didn't like this. So even his early work on the photoelectric effect kind of kicked off a lot of the thinking around quantum physics, he actually really didn't like this implication of it that things are probabilistic. So he had the famous phrase, you know, we, we think it's probably a poor paraphrasing, but everyone <laughs> thinks he said it anyway or, or repeats it. So I will. And it, that he said, God does not play dice with the universe. And then Niels Bohr responds, God doesn't care what you think, right? So this is the new, this is the new world. He's like the old age of physicists. They like things deterministic. We're happy with probabilistic. And that was a, that was a big change. I'm just imagining like Einstein and Bohr having this like roast battle in like the early 1900s. It's just such a ridiculous concept. Um, yeah, and then the famous thought experiment, Schrodinger's cat, which I will attempt to explain, <laughs> which is like somewhat, I mean, kind of well, quite a well-known thing. I think misunderstood in a lot of ways. People thought that Schrodinger was kind of saying this in a serious way, but it was actually just to highlight how ridiculous probabilistic thought process was. But anyway, yeah, so we have this Schrodinger's cat, which is this famous experiment that imagines a cat in a sealed box with a device that has a 50% chance of killing the cat 
uh, on a quantum event. So it has to be somewhat random, somewhat unpredictable, like the decay of a radioactive atom. Um, and according to quantum mechanics, until the box is opened and observed, the cat is considered to be in a state of superposition, superposition. So it's both alive and dead at the same time simultaneously. And this just kind of, well, the whole point of this was Schrodinger made this to illustrate the weirdness of quantum mechanics, especially when you applied like this, this superposition state we're going to talk about in a lot more detail on the big scale. Like it works very well at tiny scales, like Jack was saying there. But when we apply it to things like cats, it makes no sense. So he basically made this just to highlight how ridiculous it was on the big scale. Yeah, exactly. And this this term superposition is is really interesting. We'll get into it later, but it's it's uh, you can think of it as almost like adding together. It's both this and this. So in the case of the poor cat, it's both dead and alive before you make the observation. You lift the lid and find out. And when you lift the lid, you, you're also doing something called collapsing the wave function, which is way beyond the scope of this this episode but it's basically the idea that when you when you make an observation about a quantum system it collapses from this superposition state of many possible states into a single one of either of them or one of many so that's kind of one of the key themes as well exactly and, and you know when jack was a kid he was very interested in this he ran many such experiments and most times the cat was dead when he opened the box no i'm joking <laughs> Didn't Not cat that, person. legally <laughs> <laughs> clearly um so yeah this was all well and good and fun like we say there was a lot of kind of um introduction of the quantum realm that was opposing classical thinking and lots of research that kind of came about because of this it was all well and good a lot of theoretical fun a lot of things that came about but we're not going to go into too much detail until around the 1980s where another big dog in the space richard Feynman and someone called david dutch who had actually never heard of before proposed the idea of a quantum computer so basically using these properties that we're talking about these crazy weird quantum level subatomic particle properties that could actually simulate quantum systems more efficiently than classical computers and these this is the reason we're talking about this today like this isn't a physics podcast this is a tech podcast and quantum computers is the word of the day basically so all these crazy effects how can we use them in computing and we'll touch on that a bit later in the show yeah exactly and i guess one of the key points to highlight there is just simply the fact that the, the quantum revolution in physics generally was happening from nine, starting in the 1920s and, and 1930s when you had this kind of this battle back and forth of thought experiment after thought experiment as a retort between all these great minds. Quantum theory eventually won out. Everyone had to kind of accept it. And then it was used as a new model of thinking. And there's been so much research done since that. Lots of things that we now use are based on these principles and, and our understanding of the universe. But it took until the 1980s, it took another 50 years or so before people started saying, oh, what if we could use this to, to, to create computers? Well, if we did have a way of using quantum systems and computers, mm -hmm. we might be able to do much more powerful things than just what we can do with classical computers based on, you know, the, the, the typical transistors architecture that we have. So, yeah, it's, it, it was a long it was a long time before people turned their attention to computers itself. it's often the way isn't it like again like you're saying this was all theoretical in the 1980s it's only been the last like 10 years that the hardware has kind of caught up to make this stuff practical but yeah let's jump into it so let's jump into qubits and it's kind of how we're using it today well not us personally but you know some people much smarter than us um Okay, when we think of like traditional classical computers, they use bits, right? I hope that we all know that, which is the smallest unit of information, which can be in one of two states, zero or one. So you can kind of think of it like a tiny switch that is either off or on, zero, one, okay? And classical computers use billions of these bits to process and store information, like just combining them in various ways. And you see Jason Huang of NVIDIA, the whole point is to get you know more and more bits into a tinier and tinier space. And it's getting harder and harder to scale these things you know, vertically and we have to do more and more horizontally. Yeah, exactly. So computers that we know of today, we have in our homes, they're all based on the principles of bits as a way of storing information doing operations on them, calculations and things. And then in quantum computing, the shift is from bits to qubits, so quantum bits. Now, these quantum bits, the difference is that they are themselves a quantum state and they are all a superposition of multiple states. So whereas a normal bit can be in one state, either zero or one, qubits are always a superposition of multiple states. So they could be a bit of zero and a bit of one until you kind of measure them and collapse the wave function into one of the two. Essentially, that's that's what qubits are. 
I think we've lost 95%. What's the probability we've lost 95% that exists in both the state of zero and one at the same time? But yeah, so this is kind of the first bit of mind bogglingness okay? But what exactly is a qubit? So how do we actually achieve this? Uh, we're not going to touch too much on this stuff, but there's a few ways to kind of represent these qubits. Like, I think one of the most popular and somewhat easy to understand ways is the idea of an electron spin. So electrons can spin up or down, and, you know, if it's spinning up, it's in one state, it's spinning down, it's in the other state. But like Jack said, we have this property of superposition, which means that it can, you know, be in a state that's both up and down simultaneously. Its probability of going up is 80%, probability of going down is 20%, so it's both states at the same time. There's a few different ways to achieve this. There's like photon polarization, superconductor circuits, and trapped ions. But that is all we're going to say on those because they're even more complicated and, you know, we're not it's too much for us, basically. Yeah, and the remaining five or ten percent of the audience we hadn't lost, I think we've we've now lost. So we're just speaking on our own, Alec. But yeah, and just just to mention briefly, um, that word spin that will come up later. That's a physical property of an electron. So you might, if you've done physics or chemistry in school, you know some things can have like a positive or negative charge. Spin is just another property of an electron that you know other things don't have, but electrons happen to have it, and we call it spin. So it's an abstract concept, but yeah, the, the key point is that it can be up or down. Or in a quantum case, you might have them in a potentially up or down state. Yeah, exactly. So Jack has already kind of touched on this idea of superposition. Like we said, we think of bits... They can represent zero or one. And Jack is saying that we're kind of the Schrodinger's cat style. The bit is both zero and one. The cat is both dead and alive at the same time. It's quite an abstract thing to, to think of. But effectively, this qubit can hold multiple possibilities at once. One, a classical computer can only hold one possibility at once for, for each bit. Um, mathematically, do you want to go into this, Jack? It's a bit more of your <laughs> niche. Yeah, and it is very abstract, but... The way you can think of, I think the best way to think about it is, whereas a bit is either zero or one, a qubit is is like saying it's some percentage zero, some percentage one, and we add those together, and that kind of defines the qubit. So you could prepare a qubit again. A qubit you have to use a a physical system, like a physical quantum system, to represent a qubit. Um, but you could pre prepare it so it's 20% 0, 80% 1 as a kind of crude example, or 50% 0 and 50% 1, that kind of thing. Um, now, the, the big difference in terms of computation between bits and qubits is now, this, <laughs> I'll, I'll do my best to explain it as simply as possible. Mm -hmm. But when you have bits, every time you add a new bit, so again, you use many, many bits to encode things like numbers. Um, so, you know, you might you might need a few bits to encode the number 10, for example, in binaries, in zeros and ones. For every additional bit you add, you double the number of possible states that can be represented. With qubits, for every bit you add, you double the number of states that can be represented simultaneously. And essentially, that's the, the difference, because bits can only ever represent one state at one time. So you can have many bits together, but they only represent one state. With qubits they can represent this kind of superposition of many, many, many different states. And that grows kind of exponentially the more you add. So the long and the short of it is the more qubits you can put together in a room, <laughs> in a computer, in a quantum computer, then the more things you can represent at once, which is, you know, this is the, where the, hum the huge innovation and, and kind of efficiency gain of using quantum computers can be. Now, we'll talk about the practicalities later, but that's in theory yeah. why they're so much better. Like how many qubits do you need in a room to fix a light bulb? Change a light um, bulb. But yeah, th well, this is one of the, the crazy things. It's this idea that it can happen instantaneously. And I do wonder, like, what does it mean by instantaneously? That's the bit that kind of blows my mind is, you know, when we have three bits, normal classical bits, like obviously the computer can represent the same number of states, but it has to flick between them to change the states and then, you know, run it through the software to then get an output. Whereas we're saying in quantum computing, it represents all those bits simultaneously. And it just does all the states. If you put them all and say, optimize this, okay? So so my understanding is, and this kind of throwing another, another term here, is that we basically, okay, so like Jack said, we have several bits and they represent many combinations of noughts and zeros. Then we have this thing called parallelism where computers, quantum computers can apply operations to these combinations of states at the same time. 
and this allows quantum computers to basically explore lots of possibilities simultaneously and much faster than classical computers. And then like this simultaneously thing we kind of said, basically you have this property called interference where you have like quantum algorithms that use this, this property interference to manipulate the qubits so that the paths, paths, whatever that means, leading to the correct answers basically reinforce each other while the paths leading to the wrong answers kind of cancel each other out. So this is the step that we say is like kind of simultaneous, the kind of it's happening in the background and effectively you're having these qubits that will eventually go to the right answer in a way. And then when you measure that final answer, it collapses into that right answer state. So it's kind of like, I would just describe this for now, this interference stuff as a bit of a black box. Maybe we'll talk about it in more detail another time. But that's the kind of stuff that's happening when we say simultaneously, you know, all these states are measured at the same time. They're interfering. The right paths are kind of aggregating and you're left with the right state, which at the end, when you measure it, it's the right state. And it comes out as a zero, one, zero, that kind of thing. Like we'd understand in traditional computing. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good way of describing it. It's because it is very difficult and abstract to understand. I think, you know, not many people in the world that aren't directly working on this stuff will will know about, you know, these concepts. So the, the way I understand it is when we typically think about computation, we're thinking about evaluating some kind of function, right? So y equals f of x. So x is my input. I want to run a function on that input and find out the answer. Now, one of the common things we do when we compute is I want to run that function over many, many different inputs and find out what's the best output. So what's the best Y mm. for the X that I put into that function? In the classical computing world, you can only do this one by one. I can choose an X, I can chuck it in my function and get a Y and then check the next one and the next one and the next one and then see which one came out best. In quantum, you can, instead of putting in a single X, right, because in, in bits, you can only represent one X at a time, in a quantum state, you can basically take many, many different X's, so many, many different inputs, and do this superposition slash interference type process. So your actual input is an aggregate of many different inputs. Then you run the mm. function over the aggregate, and then the output is like this, this aggregate output as well. But when you measure it, it tells you what the, the most probable best answer is. So yeah, it's exactly, it's exactly what you said. It's just, I like to think of it as something like high school math, like y equals f of yeah, x, yeah. because otherwise I just start losing my mind a little bit with it. And now we've lost each other. So there's no one listening to the podcast. Yeah, I kind of like to think of it from a coding perspective as a for loop, basically. It just, mm -hmm. classical computing, I define the x, it goes through the list of commands to see what the number is at the end, evaluate at the end. I just think of it as a for loop where it does all the values of x and works out the best for me. Okay, so that's kind of superposition. Now we get on to the other one, entanglement. And um, I think Einstein defined this or kind of stated this was um, like spooky action at a distance, which I think summarizes it. Um, this is basically, an, I would say, an even weirder quantum phenomenon, which is where you can have these two kind of these two quantum particles or two objects that become linked so that the state and properties of one particle is directly related to the state of the other. And the mind boggling bit here is that can happen even if they're far apart. So a lot of people have we'll maybe talked about this a bit later. I've talked about this as kind of like instantaneous, instantaneous like teleportation or instantaneous communication over distance and all this this bonkers stuff. But yeah, this stuff is a bit mind boggling. Yeah, it, I, I agree. This is you have the two things: superposition, entanglement. They're the cause, and entanglement is the spooky one, as Einstein said. So. <laughs> I think I, I like to describe this one with an example. So we've talked about radioactive decay already, that the particle in the box that might or might not kill the cat. And then we also yeah. mentioned spin. So let's say you have an initial radioactive particle and it has a spin of neither up nor down. It's spin zero, basically, in, in this world. Mm -hmm. It then decays and emits two electrons. Now, electrons can have spin up or down, and the conservation laws mean that if we started with zero spin, I have to end with zero spin. So the electrons, one of them has to be up, one of them has to be down because they cancel, right? So then we still have zero spin overall. So we know that for a fact. And these two electrons have been fired out into the ether now, into space. So we don't know which, which of those electrons is the up one, which is the down one until we measure it. So let's say mm -hmm. they go hurtling off into different ends of the universe and they travel for millions and millions of light years of distance. Then we measure one of them 
and we say, okay, this one's spin up, then we immediately know the other one is spin down, but we didn't have to measure it. So it's almost like the, 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 the spin down electron is communicating with us at faster than the speed of light, right? Because we've met, we, it's like we measured it and that information mm. traveled to us faster than it could have done and breaking the speed of light law. Now, this is kind of a philosophical thing. And, and some, well, I think a lot of people don't actually think that this violates the, the speed of light. And, you know, there's lots of ways you can rationalize that. But that's what Einstein was getting at. Like, how can we have this almost instantaneous communication of information about the state of these two things just by measuring one over here i now know what the other one is over there it's kind of kind of strange right yeah that is bonkers because like that doesn't that doesn't really sound like communication right we're not getting faster than like communications okay which is like one of the big things that i found to see is like the the clickbait things on this um and then the important thing is even though we kind of can get some state information we're not transporting the actual matter information so i think like the properties of you know lights fast like the speed of light and all this kind of stuff is, is maintained um but yeah and the other important thing is quantum entanglement is crucial for all this stuff and that is very very trickly and fiddly to kind of do i saw an example of a research group that achieved this over a few kilometers distance away which is like absolutely mind-boggling because these things have to be kept in such kind of we'll talk about it a bit later when we talk about practical mm -hmm. developments of quantum computers but they have to be kept in such kind of perfect conditions where they can have no kind of interaction with the outside world so it's really tricky to do this in any kind of practical scale yeah exactly and i think as, as a stranger concept as entanglement is the key the key points for me are okay one it's a physical phenomenon it's part of quantum physics this idea, but then we can bring it into the quantum computing world by saying, okay, we have two qubits, we can entangle them together. And then what that means is when you measure one of them, then you instantly know what the other one is in, in some sense, you know something about the other one, which is obviously impossible in uh, classical computing because, you know, say I have two numbers encoded in the classical computer, just by reading one of the numbers, I don't know what the other number is. But we, if you have these entangled qubits, then by measuring one of the qubits, I know something. Um, uh, I, I know something numerical about the other one, and that's one of the things that helps speed up and do much more complex, much more complicated operations in a quantum computer that would, ne would never be possible with just a, a bits-based system in classical computing. So that's that's the key thing I think to take away from this. Yeah, that's a good point. It's less about the kind of the communication between people and blah, 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 that we're kind of inferring there. It's more about the fact that these things can kind of directly relate to one another. And then you can create much more complex systems because of that. It's very different to like normal yeah. bits. So let's do a quick summary of what we've learned, hopefully learned so far. Um, superposition. This allows qubits to exist in multiple states simultaneously. So it kind of enables quantum computers to process many possibilities at once which vastly increases their computational power for very specific tasks. We'll talk about that, I imagine, in a bit more detail at some point. Then we have entanglement, which links qubits together in such a way that the state of one kind of instantly influences the state of another, regardless of distance. And this, again, allows us to facilitate much more powerful quantum algorithms. We're going to talk about a bit later, secure communication and error correction. And together, these things basically fundamentally change how we do computing, especially when compared with classical computing. Wow, that was quite a lot on the brain. Yeah. Okay, so we've been very theoretical so far. Um, we've maybe just got a handle on what quantum physics is and what quantum computing is based on that quantum physics. So what does this mean in practice? Like, how do we build a quantum computer? What the hell is it made up of? So should we just go into some of the basics of that, right? So I mentioned already that qubits have to be based on a, a, a quantum physical system, like something based on electrons or atoms or something prepared in a very difficult way. And this is exactly the case. If you're going to build a quantum computer, just in the same way that classical computers rely on complex circuits of transistors, like physical electrical components to process information to represent bits. Quantum computers are also built on these physical systems. They just have to be built on very carefully prepared physical systems, right? You have to, as you said, build these uh, entangled states of particles and things like that. Um, but these are these essentially become the basic building blocks of quantum computers, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, but the problem is it's way more complicated, like we kind of touched on. Like the tricky thing is you entangle these qubits 
Um, and maintaining that entanglement is extremely tricky. They're tr extremely sensitive once they've kind of become entangled. And this is where the real magic of quantum computing happens. But it's a kind of incredibly hard to maintain. I was reading like an article on this stuff and it was like, you know, you're spinning two plates on separate sides of the room and you have to keep the plates in sync while people are throwing tomatoes at you or something ridiculous yeah. like that. And if there's like any kind of external stimulus at all, because these qubits and their entanglement is so sensitive, if they interact with any surroundings, they basically lose all their quantum properties and become the de decoherence is the state, basically the, the kind of the process, and they become decohered. Is that the right term for the past tense of that? Um, and they're no yeah. longer entangled. Yeah, exactly. So, if, you know, back to our case of those two electrons firing off into, into space, if one of those electrons is then impacted and hit by another particle, say another electron coming from somewhere else, then its its spin might be changed by that. So no longer do we have this property where if I measure one, I know the other because it's been hit by something else. It's been changed. So yeah, that's why you have to have this extreme, um, this extreme isolation of both of the, of the environment of the, of that you're creating this qubit in to make sure you don't get those external factors changing things. So essentially we have quantum computers built of qubits which are these very very sensitive and hard to procure physical quantum systems then we also you know we've had this analogy of qubits to bits but computers are more than just bits you have complex logic happening underneath right you have logics gates and circuits are the kind of thing the language we'd use in computers and you have exactly the same thing in quantum computers you have quantum gates and quantum circuits yeah exactly um and similar to how like you know traditional logic gates happen we have like and or not which is just ways of flipping the bits like we have these quantum gates that are the, basically the building blocks in a, a similar way and a quantum gate can manipulate the state of a qubit or set of qubits as jack kind of spoke about earlier um and because qubits can be in this superposition state where there are you know, many states at the same time, quantum gates can create and control these superpositions in a way that classical gates can't. Like we kind of, Jack was talking about, we can have this, say if we have a three qubit, which can represent, you know, naught, no, let's do a two qubit. I don't want to go through all the possibilities. We have naught, naught, one, naught, naught, one, and one, one. You can kind of change the probability of it representing each of those. So instead of it being a you know, normal distribution, uniform distribution of 25% likelihood of it reaching, reaching any of those or collapsing into any of those, these kind of these quantum gates can actually change it. So it's 90% going to be naught, naught, and then, you know, 3%, 3%, 3%, that kind of stuff. So it gets a lot more complicated than just one state. It changes the probability of each of those states basically being likely. Yeah. And I think maybe just for, you know, breaking this down fully, the purpose of gates and circuits, because again, gates are just ways of combining two bits together in classical computers. And then you build circuits from lots of different gates so it's basically how do we mm. take bits how do we do things with them how do we add them kind of um how do we how do we process them to, to do something meaningful like perform a calculation and quantum gates and quantum circuits are exactly the same quantum gates just allow you to manipulate qubits except that means they have to be much more complex than hmm. our classical gates and circuits because they're doing they're, they're transforming a quantum physical system again this very delicate thing um it's very hard to do this so yeah I, I don't know too much about the details about how quantum gates work but that's the key that's the key analogy between them and then quantum circuits are just built from you know many many different quantum gates all put together to do something specific right so my f of x that i mentioned earlier my function that i want to compute that will be represented by a quantum circuit that adds all of these smaller operations together. Yeah, and like we were saying, because of superposition and entanglement, these quantum circuits can handle a massive amount of information simultaneously. You know, we kind of think of the classic kind of logic gates and circuits of computers that almost one bit at a time passing through. That it's not it doesn't have to be, but that's like the kind of how we would describe it. Whereas in these quantum circuits, we can handle multiple states simultaneously and lots more information, making incredible power, incredibly powerful. But at the moment, for very specific, so how do we actually achieve a lot of this? So one of the kind of the leading ways to achieve these computers with all these complex logic gates and circuits for qubits is the idea of a superconductor based quantum computer. 
sounds like kind of the evil villain's big reveal at the end of the movie. Um, and, you know, a lot of the big names like Google, IBM have been using this apo- approach to push the boundaries of quantum te- tech in, in, well, I guess the last 10, 15 years. I think one of the it, kind of the interesting examples that if anyone's aware of this stuff at all that we will be aware of is Google claimed this quantum supremacy with its 53 qubit quantum computer which isn't that much if you kind of think of it in terms like classical like the number of bits right that's actually not that much but in terms of like how it scales 53 bits is an incredible amount which is called sycamore which solved the problem in 200 seconds that would have taken a classical supercomputer 10,000 years and that is just bonkers to compare those two things yeah and and that term quantum supremacy is interesting right because it means it's uh, where a quantum computer can actually beat a classical computer and it, in practice. So we know in theory that quantum computers should be able to beat classical computers on most things all the time. But actually achieving that supremacy in practice is the thing that Google was so proud of and is you know mind boggling that we did it, you know, as you said, with just 53 qubits. And yeah, the approach, as you said, that they take um, Google, IBM, all these big companies building these systems is the superconductor model. And I think this is actually a bit more tangible than what we've been talking about so far because superconductors are actually like bigger macroscopic things to think about. They are they are bulk material. So we're not just talking about electrons anymore. Superconductors are materials that exhibit very special properties when you supercool them, right? To z- nearly near zero temperatures, right? Zero Kelvin. So not zero degrees Celsius on a cold day in the UK. But it's <laughs> absolute zero where there's no thermal energy at all that you have to get very close to that. And when you do cool these materials down to those kind of temperatures, then they become near perfect electrical conductors. So electrons can flow freely through them with zero resistance, which makes them very, very useful. And it just so happens that a few of these superconductors and when they put them together in a certain way, they can be used to uh, create quantum systems, essentially. Yeah, and there's lots of other really cool effects of these superconductors that probably aren't super relevant for like this podcast. One is the, what's it called? The Meissner effect, where you get this um, gravitational, or not gravitational, this magnetic force that's being pushed off it. So seeing all these kind of like um, maglev ideas about like super trains and all this kind of stuff using these superconductors um and also like the potential potential for energy savings obviously and, like if you've got like basically as, as you said as jack just described this kind of this this perfect flow of electrons then you have no resistance being built up and as a lot of people anyone who's studied electronics knows that you get a lot of heat dissipation when you have a lot of electricity running through certain currents so the idea of having no loss is a perfect energy system is obviously good for sustainability good for the world good for a lot of things so these superconductors obviously in high demand right now extremely expensive to produce have to be maintained like in, in a super kind of um, again, very costly environment for them to work officially. I think one of the kind of the big breakthroughs in the last few years in my mind is graphene and the idea of using graphene for this. But mass production of graphene is still quite difficult, but it's kind of, it's getting there. So the idea of these becoming cheaper to produce and kind of more popularized is, is quite exciting because there's a lot of cool things you can do with them, even outside of the quantum stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so I want to take a little tangent now to talk about Josephson junctions, and I'm going to nerd out a little bit. Um, so superconductors are the materials and then Josephson junctions are a, a, a specific, uh, type of physical phenomenon where you bring two superconductors together, separated by a small insulator. And when you call those enough, the electrical properties of that, the conductivity is so great that electrons can pass through the insulator. Okay. That it's kind of mind boggling. And these junctions are actually the core of most modern uh, quantum computers, to my, to my knowledge. I mean, maybe they're not telling us everything. Maybe they've got better methods. But mm. from what I've seen, this is the core of a lot of them. Um, and I've actually got some experience with these myself. I, like, I actually built a few oh. of these junctions in, in, in my physics days. So they're, they're very cool things to do. Well, and this is because the guy who, in- is it anything to do with the fact that the guy who introduced this, you know, Brian jo- Josephson, was at Cardiff University? Is that the reason? No, I mean, that's the other interesting thing, right? So yeah, Josephson Junctions were made by Brian Josephson. He's the only Nobel Prize winning Welshman, I think. <laughs> really? Maybe not, wow. maybe not surprising. But yeah, he, he won the Nobel Prize for, for um, inventing or discovering, however you want to call it, these special junctions that allow for a quantum effect, quantum tunneling through the insulating barrier. 
Um, but yeah, it was just a happy coincidence that he's he's also from Cardiff, mm. <laughs> like myself. But yeah, it was in my in my undergrad uni days. We had a practical experiment to do them. And, you know, I can tell you from experience, just creating one of these junctions, a single one and observing the quantum effect is incredibly difficult. We had a <laughs> vat of, I think, liquid helium. So that's what, mm. one of the things you use to, to cool it down to around seven Kelvin to so seven degrees Kelvin above um, absolute zero. And just to get this one, you know, tiny observation of this of this of this electrical current flowing, it, it took days and days of effort to get it to work. <laughs> it had this like vat of liquid mm -hmm. helium that was kind of waist or chest height, you know. And and if that's how difficult it is just to make one of these junctions uh, for a few split seconds, then I can't imagine how difficult it is to use these to build qubits, right? Which is what Google and, and IBM are doing. Yeah, I mean, you kind of we led on to the, um, what I want to talk about now is the practical considerations of this. Like we've kind of touched on a few times now, the whole point of these superconductors is they have magical properties when they're kept incredibly cool. So obviously these supercomputers, which are based on superconductors, have to also be kept incredibly cool. And one of the reasons that you know this is ex extremely expensive is because you have to use extremely pricey cooling agents, like Jack was just talking about there, helium. And I think like the the cost of helium alone is probably one of the biggest barriers to this being you know widespread well spreadly spreadly fucking up <laughs> adopted on the mainstream um and that, i think that's actually one of the biggest barriers for supercomputers generally in terms of price is the cost of helium actually which is quite surprising um and yeah i think that the average cost of one of these quantum computers is in the tens of millions even if you don't take into account all the R and D that's been pumped into it, just the manufacturing and the maintaining of them costs tens of millions just to run. I think it is more than anything. Yeah, exactly. The the materials are expensive. Those superconductors and the the cooling agents, the the, the running costs extremely high to maintain those temperatures all the time. And then, yeah, as you mentioned earlier, for these entangled states, which give you the real superpowers of quantum computing, then isolating those systems while all this is going on and making sure there's nothing else interacting with these highly uh, delicate quantum states that you're using for your calculations is is I, I have no idea how they achieve that i'm happy to be straight up on that i think that's that's probably very much in the in the trade secrets world of these big companies <laughs> and maybe we'll find out one day but yeah i i definitely don't know how they're achieving this and yeah and that's kind of where we stand today so even though it's extremely challenging and costly to build these systems these superconductor based quantum computers this is exactly what is looking most advanced and most promising in the market right this is what as a google and ibm are doing there's a kind of space race going on right now to build the best quantum computers fast enough to to, to add more qubits that's kind of how they're measured right how many qubits can we have uh, maintained for a long period of time this is how they measure it so yeah, you know, one day these are potentially going to be used to revolutionize many different industries like cryptography, material science, you know, things that are, even today's best supercomputers can't actually handle. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think we'll get more into that in the next episode, right? But I think that covers where we are with quantum computers today. Yeah, I've seen this kind of this quantum dominance term and like the quantum race kind of being used in, in the media to see which country is going to lead the way. And it's kind of quite similar to the AI AGI conversation where as soon as someone hits a practical way to do this with, with quantum computing, they're going to be, what was the equivalence? 10,000 years to 200 seconds ahead of everyone else. And mm -hmm. let's see, like I've seen, there's a lot of big, obviously a massive push in the private companies in America, a massive push in from China. So let's see, it'd be cool to see if this stuff gets commercialized and we will have quantum computers in our basement for gaming in the next like uh, five years. Um, but yeah, so I see, I don't know if anyone's listening because a lot of this stuff was very complicated, but yeah, it's been a fun episode. We covered the origins of quantum mechanics, quantum theory, super high level on qubits and their superpowers superposition entanglement we tried to explain what that actually means and um, we touched on some of the basic properties of quantum computers and some of the practical considerations that there are when i holding these things out um, and yeah next time we will talk more about the impact of quantum computing the applications of quantum computing and is it actually possible to make this practical and commercial so yeah lots to more to talk about this this doesn't end here um and with that i'll say thank you for listening to whoever's listening wherever you may be and join us next time to untangle a little more of web3
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Untangling Web3. Don't forget to send us your thoughts, questions, and comments on social media. And be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast provider to catch the next episode. See you next time to untangle a little bit more of Web3. The views we express here are our own and do not reflect the views of our employers.